everybody. It's great to be together with you again this morning as we come to open up God's Word together. Uh, we've had a couple of weeks um, as a church where we've just been doing a couple of different things, connecting with um, vineyard churches around the Southwest, hearing from Jay Pathak over in the States. But it's great, isn't it, to be back together this morning. Uh, we're going to pick up our series, God's Story and Ours, again. And in it, um, if you're new to it, we've been tracing the single storyline of the Bible by drilling down into three parts of the Bible. The first four chapters of Genesis that tells us how God made the world, but also tells us what's wrong with the human race that caused it to be broken. The first four chapters of Romans that tells us what God's done about it. And the last four chapters of Revelation that tell us how history is going to turn out in the end. And we're going to come today to a passage in Romans 3. Uh, and if you have a Bible, it'd be great if you could open that with me. We're going to be reading from Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 9 to 20. And this is what it says. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Paul has spent, as we've seen in the last two chapters in Romans 1 and Romans 2, really describing something very profound. In Romans 1, we really read about who, the, who Jesus calls the younger son in the parable of the two sons, the Gentile who runs away from the father. And we reach this list in chapter 1 that shows us that the person who runs away from the father, like the younger son in the parable, is filled with every kind of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity. And then in chapter two, we read really of the older son in the parable of the two sons, the Pharisee, the religious person who looks down on the younger son and expects the father to reward him for his discipline and moral behavior. And shockingly, Paul says at the beginning of chapter two that the older son is no different to the younger one. Indeed, he says um, that they're the same. They're guilty of the same sins. Why? Because they are primarily sins of the heart and not the flesh. And as Jesus showed in the Sermon on the Mount, there is no one, no one, religious, irreligious, who can stand up to the law and remain clean except for the grace and forgiveness of Christ. And so what we have here in this passage in Romans 3 is really Paul's summary statement of what has gone before, before he moves on into chapter 4 to what Christ has done. And here then is a summary statement of what the Bible calls the doctrine of sin, of what is wrong with the human heart. And again, friends, when we read through this passage, it's shocking. It's perhaps even more direct than what we've already seen in Romans 1 and 2. And we're going to unpack this a little today. And in it, we're going to learn three things about sin. First, the egalitarianism of sin. Second, the trajectory of sin. And third, the cure for sin. So first, the egalitarianism of sin. In verse 9 and 10, Paul says, no one is righteous. There is no one who understands. No one seeks God. And elsewhere, he says, Jew and Gentile alike are under sin. Religious, irreligious, under sin. Is anyone better, he says? No. And what he's saying here is that 
There is no difference between moral and immoral people. There's no difference between religious and secular people. All are alike, he says, and under sin. And in verse 19, it, he says that the whole world is accountable, and that word accountable is a judicial word, and it means liable for punishment. And Paul is saying no matter who you are, no matter what your record, no matter whether you've lived a life of altruism and compassion and service or a life of cruelty and exploitation or a life somewhere in between, we're all lost, we're all condemned, we all deserve to be rejected by God. Now you're probably sitting there this morning thinking, how can that be? How can it be that no one seeks God? How can it be that no one does good? Surely it's an overstatement. Well, the answer's going to come in part two, and it's shocking. But, I mean, surely we're thinking it's an over-exaggeration, but not at all, as we'll see in, in point two. But for point one, Paul is saying basically this. A criminal robbing and murdering people and a moral, upright person who thinks because of his good deeds and righteousness that he's owed blessing and respect, as different as they may look on the surface, underneath, they're both expressions of the same radical self-centeredness, the same self-absorption that is sin. All are alike, he says. And this, friends, is radical um, egalitarianism. This is the starting point, friends, for the glorious gospel. And if you're sitting there this morning, if you're something like me, you hate it. We can't get our heads around how that can be. And many people we speak to in our everyday lives, you think maybe they're living a good life. They can't stand the fact that there's nothing different to them, moral, maybe upstanding people, than it is to people who are outwardly in sin. Yet this is the beginning of our gospel. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. That was the first beatitude. And this is the starting point if we're to be saved. Now, what are the implications of this? What are the implications of the fact that we are all alike? Well, maybe this morning you're thinking about Christianity. Maybe you've been searching and seeking and thinking, what does it mean to be a Christian? And maybe you're coming this morning, like many do, with a model in your mind for how it works. And it probably goes something like this. There's this and that that I must do for God. And if I do it, God will do stuff for me. In other words, there's a good life I must adopt and a bad life I must reject if I'm to be a Christian. And many Christians, even if you're sitting there this morning, we can so easily be ensnared by that, can't we? If we live a good life, God will bless us. If we don't, he won't. Now, yes, while being a Christian does mean and has meant for many of us, many of us can give testimony to the fact that when we become Christians, God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, begins to clean up our lives. But whatever Paul is talking about here, whatever Jesus is talking about, they can't be calling us simply to stop bad living and to start good living. Because what Paul is saying here is that people who have been practicing good living are no better. They're in the same place, spiritually speaking, as the people who've been living badly. So to become a Christian is not to stop doing certain things and to start doing certain things. The gospel is not that. It doesn't fit the model that you'd expect it to be. But the second implication is maybe for those of us who've already embraced Christianity, and do you realize, again, this morning, the radical nature of what Paul is saying and what he's been saying in these first two chapters? You see, for Paul, who'd been a Pharisee himself, he would have been, as a Pharisee, a man who would have considered Gentiles, irreligious people, to be spiritual dogs, unclean. And he would have looked at the thief and the robber and the rapist and said, you're spiritual dogs. But now here he is saying, I'm no different. And not only that, but as we know of Paul, he begins to dedicate his life to living alongside these people. So do you see in this what the gospel does? 
You see, Paul was a man who big swathes of the human race, he would have scorned and written off and showed no love, no respect for. Yet the gospel has radically rehumanized them for Paul, and it can do for us. You see, if we embrace a doctrine that says we are no different, it's what the Bible calls the doctrine of total depravity, that without God, we're no different to anybody else. It might look like it on the surface, but we're not. That no one is good, that all are alike. What will that make you think of other people? Do you think it might make you look down on other people? Definitely not. If you believe it and take it to the center of your life, it will rehumanize the human race for you. And all kinds of people you would never have given the time of day to, you will begin to learn to love and respect. Why? Because you realize you're no better. And so, as it tells us in Matthew 25, when we're instructed, aren't we? Whatever we do to the least of these, who are the least in your life? Who are the people you look down on? Who are the people who are spiritual dogs to you? Maybe it's a particular group of people. Maybe it's the homeless. Maybe it's people who are rude. Maybe it's people with a different sexuality to you. Who are the people who you find difficult to look at and love? Paul says that when we embrace this idea that we're no different to all everybody else, your least will be loved by you. I've loved watching over the last few days, and many of you will love to watch Todd White. And I want to point you to a particular YouTube video that really when I watched it, I wept all the way through it. And there's a video of Todd White going to, I think, Brazil. And he prays for a Satanist. And here's this guy dressed with horns. He's got Satan written across his, his top. He's got an upside down cross. He's, he, he's a Satanist. And Todd White approaches him and he talks to him and he prays for him and he hugs him and he tells him that he loves him and he tells him how much God loves him. You know, that's what happens when we grasp this idea that there is nobody different to us and that we're only changed by the gospel. You know, you want to know how to speak to people, watch Todd White. You know, it's often, how do I speak to people who are different to me? How do I speak to people I might find really difficult to speak to? Well, I want to give you some clues here because, you know, Todd White, I think, models it beautifully and I encourage you to watch him. First thing is get rid of the big E. Get rid of this idea that we're out to just evangelize people. People are not projects. And when we get that we're all alike, that we're all lost, that there's no, no different between us, they might look like on the surface, but not really. When we get that, when we begin to put that at the center of our life, all we do when we go around in our everyday spheres is to love people and to show them love. And Todd White does that beautifully. And there's, you know, three things I noticed that I just want to encourage you in this week that he does so beautifully. The first thing is he doesn't, he relies on the Holy Spirit. He doesn't do it off his own strength. So he asks the Holy Spirit for words of knowledge. He asks if he can pray for people. He uses generosity. You know, he's such a good tool for the kingdom. You know, he gives people money. He says, I want to just bless you with this money. He doesn't say, I'm an evangelist, and I'm giving you this money because I want to evangelize you. No, he's just generous, both with his time, but also with his money. And lastly, he shares his own story. And when you hear Todd White share his own story, you'll realize that he has come to see that he is no different to anybody else other than the fact that Christ has saved him. You want to know how to interact with people? Get this idea that we're no different and go and love people. Give them time, talk to them, approach them, love them, be generous to them. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you words, pictures, things that you can pray for them. That's how to love people. And that's what will happen. That's the kind of people we will be when we learn that we're no different, that there's an egalitarianism to sin. But the second thing we learn is 
There's a trajectory to sin. You see, Paul says, no one seeks for God, no one does good. And we think, over the top? Surely not. Surely there's somebody who does good. Surely there's somebody who seeks God. But if you look carefully, you see, you'll see that Paul is giving us a definition of sin that goes deep. He's showing us that sin is relational before and indeed if it ever becomes behavioral. You see, he says, all have turned away. No one seeks. And notice these are directional words. And what Paul is talking about is the trajectory, the direction, your aim in life. And what he's saying, therefore, is that sin is not so much a matter of whether you're doing good or bad things, but what you're doing them for. And we're told that sin makes you want to get away from God, not towards him. Sin makes you want to get out of his gaze, from under his control. In other words, to be your own saviour and Lord, to keep him at arm's length. That's what sin makes you want to do. And there are two ways, by the way, of being your own saviour and Lord. The first is like the younger son. It's to be a law unto yourself and to live any way you want. But the second, which is much more subtle, is to be very, very good and to go to church and obey the Bible and to try and live like Jesus so that God blesses you. And that's what the older son did. But you see, you're still in that trying to get control of God. You're not seeking him, you're seeking things from him. And you see, the text doesn't say that nobody seeks blessing from God. It doesn't say no one seeks answer to prayer from God. It says no one seeks God, God himself. And so very easily your so-called serving and doing good is really for yourself. And that's what Paul is saying the trajectory of sin can be like. Let me give you an example to try and illustrate this. There was a study that showed that surprisingly, marriage that broke up, marriages that broke up due to one of the people in the marriage being an alcoholic were almost as likely to break up after that person got sober than while they were an addict. Now, why is that? Well, there's probably many reasons that we know. Trust has been broken. There's too much damage to repair. Maybe there's depression, whatever it might be. But interestingly, Alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous found that one of the reasons was that the person supporting the alcoholic all of a sudden found, as that person got sober, that they weren't needed as much. They poured their life into caring and supporting and bailing out their partner. And now, all of a sudden, they're not needed as much. And of course, what's underneath this, very subtly, is I needed you to be a mess because that's where I got my identity from. And do you see that actually this means that that person wasn't seeking the other's well-being at all, but actually their own worth. They were doing, in other words, all the right things, but for themselves. And Paul says, we're like this when it comes to God. We seek things from him, not himself. And only when things go wrong in our lives or in the world around us, do we find out whether we got into faith for God to serve us or for us to serve God. And this is the self-centeredness that makes the world a mess. You can even be running away from God in your good deeds as well as your bad behavior. That's the trajectory of sin that Paul is talking about. But finally, he talks to us about the cure for sin. And this is the middle part of the passage. It reads like this, their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, Uh, ruin and misery mark their ways. This sounds like the night of the living dead, doesn't it? But this is what we look like to God underneath all our doing good without the gospel. You see, there's anger and touchiness and turning on people and resentment and hatred and harshness. And I personally can testify to this ball of mess that can be inside me towards other people even when on the outside I look different. And it's like a spiritual leprosy. On the outside you look great, but on the inside you're falling apart. And so here at the end, 
are two things that can cure us, can cure you and me. The first thing is in verse 19. Paul says, so that their mouths may be silenced. And I want to say this as clearly and as maybe bluntly as I can. You will never be saved until you shut up spiritually. As long as you continue to justify yourself, uh, you're not ready for salvation. You can't receive the cure for sin unless you realize you can't fix it yourself. That you're never, ever going to be enough. That even trying to do so makes you worse. And by the way, shutting up doesn't mean beating yourself up. You know why? Because when you beat yourself up, when you say, look at how sinful I am, look at how bad I am, you're still centering on yourself and not on God. You see, the gospel says, on one hand, I will never be enough, ever. Yet on the other hand, as I wear Christ's robe of righteousness, I am always enough. And isn't that a beautiful oxymoron? I'll never be enough, yet in Christ I'm always enough. John Gerstner um, said this, because of the gospel, the way to God is wide open. No one can hold you back because God has offered justification to the ungodly. Nothing now stands between you and God but your good works. All you need is need. All you need is nothing. But most people don't have it. In other words, he's saying the only thing standing in the way of your salvation is your self-justification and self-righteousness. You see, salvation is not just to simply repent of your wrongdoing, your sins. The Pharisees did that. You don't only repent of your sins, but you repent of the reason that you did anything right as well. But the second thing here that can cure me is in verse 18, verses 13 to 17, this horrific night of the living dead type, type um, explanation and um, description of what we're like. And then we find out why we're like that in verse 18. And Paul says, because there is no fear of God. In other words, he's saying we wouldn't have all those things if we feared God. He's saying the fear of God is the cure. And all through the Bible, you see the fear of God is a major theme. Until you fear God, you can't even begin to think straight about reality. Now, we know that the fear of God is nothing to do with being scared. Let me read you some scriptures that it is to do with. Deuteronomy 10 tells us, what does the Lord God require of you? But to fear the Lord, to love him, and to serve him with your heart and soul. So to fear him is to love him with your heart and soul. Psalm 119 says, because you fulfill your promise to me, I will fear you. In other words, when I recognize your goodness and be overwhelmed by it, then I'm fearing you. Psalm 30 says, because you have forgiven me, I will fear you. In other words, it's to see what he's done for you. And you see in the Bible, wherever the fear of the Lord is mentioned, you'll notice that it increases when you see and experience God's salvation, his grace, his goodness, and his love. So we could give the fear of the Lord or the fear of God this definition. That the fear of God is joyful, humbling, awe and wonder before the salvation of God. And you see, it's called fear because it's not just happiness. Because when you experience these things, when you experience the wonder of God's salvation, you know, it both affirms you to the sky, yet it humbles you to the dust. That's why it's called fear. It turns you out of yourself. Homo in curvatus se. That's how Luther defines sin. Man turned in on himself. And Paul says that the fear of God will turn you out of yourself. It's the cure for sin. Joyful fear is the cure. And it happens when we see God's salvation. Now, what does that mean? Here's what it means to finish. What is God's salvation? How does looking at God's salvation cause us to fear him? It's the cure for sin. Well, in this passage, Paul says, we don't seek God. God. 
Nobody seeks God. And because of that, God's salvation is not us seeking him, but him seeking us. You see, lots of religions say you can seek God. God says, here are the rules, here are the things that you need to do. And if you pick them up and if you do them, I'm sure you can find me. It's salvation, in other words, by finding God yourself. But in Christianity, it's opposite. It's God seeking you and finding you. And if you know what he did to do that, it will fill you with this joyful, humbling, sin-curing fear. Let me illustrate what God has done to seek you and to find you. In Hosea, God asks Hosea to marry a woman called Goma. And not long after, he realizes that she is wayward and unfaithful. And even his children, he realizes, are not his. In fact, he actually calls one of them, the literal definition is not mine. And her unfaithfulness gets worse. She leaves him and the children and the last man she gets to in, in fact, sells her into slavery. And at this point in the book of Hosea, Hosea turns to God and says, remind me again why you asked me to marry her. And God basically says, so you will know something about my relationship to you. And then he says, here's what I want you to do. Go and purchase her freedom and take her back. And then you'll know what it's like to be me. So here is Goma, this woman, this broken woman, now a slave probably stripped naked, and suddenly she hears her husband's voice, and he's bidding for her. And instead of berating her, he takes his cloak, and he covers her nakedness, and he says, now you come home with me and be my wife. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that so moving to hear? And God says it's nothing compared to what God has done for you. God is saying through Hosea, poor Hosea actually, God is saying he had to go through all this and you know, literally had his life ruined so that I could give you this illustration, God is saying. And God is saying this, that Hosea, he only had to go to the next city to get Gomer back, but I had to come from heaven to earth to find you. He says, you weren't even seeking me. I had to seek you. And I didn't just have to dig down into my pockets to get money out to purchase your freedom. I had to go to the cross and to suffer and die and to pay the penalty for your sin. And I was stripped naked on the cross. And the reason that it happened was that I could clothe you with the robe of righteousness and say to you, now you come home with me. And when you see that, you see the salvation of the gospel is God seeking you like that and finding you. It's infinite cost to himself. Do you know what? That will fill you with a holy, joyful fear. And you'll find that the cure, the cure to sin has begun. Let's pray together, shall we? Holy Spirit, thank you for your word. I pray now that you would come. You would just rest on each person listening to this teaching, this message today. Thank you, Lord, that our salvation is not because we sought you, but because you sought us. And Lord, help us to see that afresh today. Maybe even through that wonderful story of Hosea and how he paid the ransom to have Goma released from slavery, and he took her home. And thank you, Lord, that you did the same on the cross, that you were made naked, that you would give us your robe of righteousness and say, now come home with me. Lord, we thank you for the wonder of your salvation, of your gospel. And we pray that as we ponder that now, that it would fill us with joyful fear, awe and wonder at what you've done for us. And it would then lead us, Lord, to look on others around us in our lives with love and compassion. Lord, no matter whether they're the least to us or not, that we would be a people who recognize that we're all alike, except for the grace of God. And would you lead us even this week, Lord, as we're about our daily lives to look on people, 
Would, would you prompt us to ask you for words of knowledge that might help us to interact with people? Would you lead us to be generous to people around us? And would you lead us, Lord, to look on people in love as you do on us? And we pray that, Lord, this morning for the glory of your name. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you enjoyed this morning and we'll be back together again next week um, when we'll be moving on to Romans 4. Have a great week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you his peace this week. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen.